I want to speak on two things that are very important in human life. First and foremost, I want to speak about the love of God and how it simply plays a vital role in the existence of humanity from a global scale. There is no any amount of love that mankind can give you that can supersede the love of God. The love of God which we call agape love is the highest form of love which can only but be given to every human being by God who is our creator and our maker. And it will interest to know that actually every single person wants to simply experience this love. And this love, it can only but be given to us all as human beings by God. I call it unconditional love. Then I also want to simply talk about rejection. The worst rejection that anyone can be able to experience is the rejection from God. If God rejects you, it doesn't matter who accepts you. Because the rejection of God is worse than human rejection. However, God was able to simply avert this rejection by sending Christ our Lord and our Savior to get us back to his everlasting love and if we want to simply put these two subjects to perspective the love of God and the rejection not from God's side this time but the rejection that emanates from mankind to mankind because again Rejection has been, you know, displayed in different ways across the universe. And no, there is no one in this world that simply embraces rejection. Rejection is the worst force that anyone can be subjected to. And that's what I want to simply help us to understand that you can choose the love of God of a man's rejection. Rejection has landed many people into a life of misery, a life of lifetime isolation, a life of social deficiency, a life of depression, a life that one contemplates on nothing less but suicide. Anything rejected seems to, if you look at something rejected, is something that is abandoned, neglected, ignored, refused. Something that nobody wants to simply get along with it, whether they inform of a person or even an item. For instance, if you have things that are not of any use in the house, that are valueless, you look at them as rejects and the best place you can take them is to the dustbin and just dump them there why because they have no use for you they are not they have not any use in the house now when you look at the word rejection it really it's vast in terms of its effect and it can be explained in different dimensions but this particular time I want to confine this rejection and this love within the realm of humanity not items but humanity and you can be able to understand that even in case you may be encountering that form of rejection there's an answer there's a cure to that and the cure is the love of God when you talk about the love of God it actually supersedes the love of mankind we have the marital kind of a love which we call eros love we have filial love we have different forms of love, but none of those kind of love can simply uh, supersede the agape love 
which is the highest form of love. It's sacrificial love. It is eternal love. It's unconditional love. And that's what every human being is craving for. Unfortunately, we want to get this agape love from our fellow human beings. The love from human beings is conditional. It is self-centered. It is a love that is based on terms and conditions. And if we want to simply see how we can be able to benefit from the love of God when it comes to the rejection that we may be facing or encountering from different persons. And I'm going to explain different uh, practical examples that will prompt people to simply reject a person. Because we as human beings, we have different ways on how we embrace persons without understanding the true nature of the love that simply emanates from God. And uh, I'm going to give an example of a personality in the Bible. Three persons actually, I'm going to simply use them as best examples to explain the subject of the love of God and rejection. So stay with me. First, I want you to understand something. In John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about the cosmic world. I'm talking about the love that is simply accorded to mankind. You know, you may say God loved the world. No, I'm talking about the, you know, the world in its cosmic form. And I'm talking about persons. God loved people. So John 3.16, John records and says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Of course, after man disobeyed the Lord in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we do understand disobeying the Lord. The consequences befell mankind, but man, mankind could not help himself. God had to send the Son, Jesus Christ, to come and die for the sins of humanity and get back mankind to his eternal love. So the salvation of mankind, or the redemption of mankind, was prompted by the love of God. So God, what he did first and foremost was he loved the world he loved mankind and then he sent his son as a sacrificial lamb as an atonement where the sins of mankind are concerned now when you accept Christ you accept the love of God because Christ came in form of the love of God his death on the cross of Calvary was an expression of God's love he sacrificed his precious son for the sake of you and me in order for us to get back to the bosom of the Father, to get back to the love of God, which is timeless love, which is endless love. And uh, I believe they'll be able to understand the bigger challenges we are simply encountering around the world. It is as a result of the absence of genuine love. Not eros love, a love that simply one person benefits and the other one doesn't benefit. I'm talking about a love that doesn't look a how you are does it's about loving the whole person agape love affects every bit of our being it is not what we call selective love no it is a love that simply brings wholeness it simply accepts the whole person in totality in entirety you know you get accepted for who you are as a person while the human love has its own limit. It's more self-centered. It's more driven by selfish interest. It is more of selfish benefits. When I love you, I love you for my own advantage, for my own benefit. Not for you, and for who you are. So I want us to put to perspective in a short while and be able to understand the effects of this rejection and more so the benefit and the healing that comes along with the love of God when it is shed abroad in our hearts and more so to the person of just Christ.
Agape love, as I said initially, is the highest form of love, is unconditional love, sacrificial love, or pure love. One of the greatest desires for every human being is to experience unconditional love. There is nothing precious in life like being loved unconditionally, being loved for you, for who you are. That's what God did through His Son Christ Jesus. He has, He loved us. The Bible says, you know, one while we were still sinners, He loved us. And every human being, young and old, they're striving to ensure that they are able to get this unconditional. And I want to make this crystal clear to you. Unless somebody is sold out to God and given holy scale to God. For you to simply extract unconditional love or to experience unconditional love from persons, I can tell you that is an uphill task. It's an uphill task. It is a mountainous venture to get what you call unconditional love from persons, from human beings. It is not easy. This can only but come from God and God alone. God unleashing this love by spirit into our lives. So, listen to this. Both young and old are working so hard to be accepted and to be valued by the society. You know, every single day everybody wants to be accepted because I'm talking about the rejection and the love of God. And every single person is really putting up an effort to be accepted to be loved for who they are, to be accepted by the society. Over time, in my journey of life and even faith, I've come to learn one thing. We live in a world that is full of self-centered persons. We live in a world whereby people will embrace you for what you can offer, not for who you are. People will love you for the gift you have. People love you for the resources you have in terms of money or any other form of resources. People love you for your beauty, for your handsomeness. People love you based on that. And I'm not just talking about a particular category of love. You know, that may be experienced from a human Right, but I'm speaking about the love of God, which is rarely found amongst humanity. So this other love that I'm trying to put across is human based. It is human driven. It's within the realm of mankind. Whereby well, they will love you for a particular reason. While on the other hand, God loves us for who we are. So throughout the journey of life, you will discover that persons strive, young and old. To make an impression in order to be accepted, to be loved for who they are, but that doesn't work easy. Most of the kind of love that people experience in their life is what we call conditional love. This begins actually goes down from the family setup. From the family setup. We have what we call competitiveness even from the family setup. One child feels that, you know, they are always not simply loved at the expect. They are always neglected and the other child probably because their performance at school is up there and they seem to be smarter than the other kids. So the parents unknowingly or subconsciously, they begin to simply express their value their love, their affection towards this child that seems to be lifted up the name of the family academically and the other one that seems to be lowering the name of the family they simply begin to overlook that child and I can tell you this has been happening I mean in a very big way around the world and, and I mean you can simply take time and figure out yourself check out yourself as a person but this has been happening that a child that seems to be lifting up the name of the family according to their abilities seems to be embraced more than the other child.
so kids grow in an imbalanced way they grow with a lot of gaps a lot of uh, you know emptiness emotionally psychologically it creates an effect on their lives they begin to become reserved they develop what I call isolative kind of a disposition they begin to come up with caves that fit them why because they are disregarded you know maybe subconsciously or cautiously in their homes so this issue of rejection is always encountered from home family setups but there is always an answer and the answer is God and I'm going to give a very good example in the Bible on how this was experienced well as we grow up in life throughout our journey of life we simply uh, you know we'll always hear different kind of you know comments being made about Irish when you go to school our siblings our fellow students teachers certain kind of you know comments will be made and these comments would simply uh, play a very big role to us if most if especially they don't simply uh, appeal well rather appear well to us in terms of like they don't simply uh, mean well where our lives are concerned and our personality you know and so you have experience at home you go to school experience the same this is based on different reasons you know and this voice says this words will keep on echoing keep on you know replaying because they are stored down deep in our subconscious mind so they'll keep on replaying replaying even as we keep growing in our journey of life now i want to show you something here a research was done by a professor mcleary and his friends from Duke, Duke University about rejection and the pain of being excluded in the same is same as the pain of being physically injured. Now this professor or this finding that was done in Duke University they were able to make a conclusion that actually rejection is equivalent to a physical pain. Now that shows you the weight that rejection plays in people's lives this is to say that if somebody has been hurt physically is similarly to somebody who has been rejected the pain seems to be same though the other one is emotional pain but this one is a physical pain physical injury this has been this is how they were able to find Rejection has serious implications for an individual psychological state and the society in general. So rejection will always simply tamper with somebody's well, way of growing in a holistic way. Because rejection can create a deficiency in terms of growth. People grow with a lot of imbalance because of the rejection they encountered in their lifetime. You know, kids that have been rejected by their fathers, by their mothers, when they're still young, innocent, just operating through instincts and no knowledge, they begin to simply encounter rejection from their time of conception. And when they grow up, even in during the formation in the mother's womb, they are void of this completely. And that's what I'm saying. The cure for this kind of deficiency is the love of God. As human beings, we can simply be selfish, self-centered, self-obsessed. Uh, you know, so only God can provide this ultimate cure from this rejection so uh, social rejection can influence emotional cognition and even physical health this social rejection does not simply does not just vastly affect 
as emotionally, but it can also affect our physical health, you know, because our health equally becomes subject to what is going on within our, within our inner being. If you're not emotionally okay, this will simply tamper with our body system. If we are psychologically okay, this will equally begin to tamper with our entire physical being. So you see, it has a very uh, negative effect on the entire person and more so even in their, you know, you know, in, in their, when they're growing like at large in life. Ultracized people sometimes can be very, can become aggressive and can turn into violent persons. This is quite true. When people experience rejection, number one, they begin to lose self-worth because sometimes we simply affirm our worth and our value from other persons like people become like our mirror and that's why a lot of people when even a child is growing there is always a need for parents to speak positive you know kind of you know to invest in the child in a positive way in order to develop their self-worth their self-image you know this is part of uh, you know part of child nurturing. Now, when this fails, when that love that simply is helped to help the child to have self-acceptance, when it's not ministered to them, they look at themselves as they are not worth. And when they are not worth, they can actually fall for anything, they'll become anything. And we have seen this happening at large, that uh, some of these parts that have really experienced rejection, they end up being so aggressive, and sometimes very violent because according to them they have nothing to lose so they become very violent and when you find some people that are violent some of them if you don't take time to study why they are violent you'll find that the problem actually is stemming down from their upbringing if we just take their journey of growth we'll be able to understand this aggression this violence that is in them actually found a place of breeding as they were growing up and it has become tandem to become a people that no one can be able to simply you know embrace you know generally as human beings there is this fundamental need to belong you know people want to belong that's why i believe god simply set up a family unit from onset when he created mankind you know say it's not good for man to be alone there were two persons and god said it was good for men to be alone and the woman was brought in the picture so we are social beings and a sense of belonging means a sense of acceptance have you ever noticed from home that's why isolation and selectiveness and segregation begins you go to school again that the element of isolation in terms of class ability to perform better there are always groupings even at the lowest level even at school you go to higher primary you go to secondary you go to high school you will simply discover there are always groupings that seem to fit amongst each other you ask yourself why are these groupings forming it is because there is always a tendency of simply believing that I fit in this group more than this group now who taught these persons these young people to come up with this formation of groups, this thing was simply discovered in their home states, in the neighborhoods. I mean, it's no secret. Sadly, it also goes straight to the church. It goes to the church. You find that them that seem to be having 
more in terms of success and stuff like that. They have this, uh, they, they develop this association of we are of this class and therefore I can relate based on our class disposition. And this other one that seems to be below our class should not be. The love of God goes beyond that. These are human findings that simply disregard others based on their outlook, their success, their abilities. But as I said again, every human being wants to have a sense of belonging without conditions. They want to feel accepted for who they are. I don't mean that when they're criminals, you just allow them as criminals. No, I'm talking about that sober, sound human being that is not given to these atrocities and other negative activities that are meant to simply interfere with the social life or the life of other people. No. Talk about people that are sound, they are sane, yet they are simply ministered this negative energy of rejection. This thing always happens in a working place. You'll find groupings. Have you never asked yourself, why do we have this kind of groupings at our place of work, in big companies, organizations, Christian organizations, and other organizations at large? Why do we have these groupings? Why do we have racial discrimination? Why do we have nepotism? Why do we have tribalism? It's because mankind at large have never understood the highest form of love that is less conditional, but that is not conditional, and that's the love of God. We accept each other for who we are, but we have become conditional beings. We have become, that's why you have to prove to be accepted. That means you have to buy acceptance. You have to simply make an effort to be accepted by persons in the community, you know. And they don't accept you literally as you, they accept your ability. They accept your credentials, but not you as a person. This is what is happening around the world. And people are hurting every day, every night. You are hearing cases of homicide cases. People are getting married when they are hurting. People are raising, raising children when they are hurting. People are working when they are hurting. People are hurting. Down deep in people's hearts, people are hurting. But there's a lot of assumption. Why are we hearing, I mean, numerous deaths just anyhow? When someone is hurting, sometimes it becomes very hard to tell this person hurting. It is called, you know, the invisible battles, the invisible bleeding that is taking place within their heart and they cannot simply scream about it. Some may be screaming, but, well, nobody may be hearing that. I had an analogy of a very interesting story about one man that had an aquarium and they had put in fish. Then, as is custom, it always put on powerful the aquarium to become warm slightly for the fish. And this time around, he came, put on the power, and the fish began swimming. But then, suddenly, he fell asleep. And while he fell asleep, the water was becoming hotter and hotter. And there is nothing bad in life like what you call silence, pain. Maybe the fish was screaming, but the voice could not be heard by the owner that had kept that fish inside there. Long story short, the fish died while screaming in silence. By the time the owner woke up, the fish was gone. This kind of love, they suffer inside. 
You get a sister, you get a brother, you get a man, you get a woman. They look beautiful, they look handsome, they look, they have all the resources. But down deep, they are hurting. Down deep, they are sick. You may not see it physically, but down deep. What would, why would one person wake up all of a sudden and just kill the person they have loved for years? Why would that happen? Because emotional illness or the absence of love deprives someone from being whole and sound. And that's why I'm pointing out the cure to all this deficiency is turning to God who can simply minister to us this eternal love for us to become whole and get healed from the wounds that keep reappearing every day and every night in our lives. I'm talking to someone out there. The effects of rejections, the effects of rejection, social rejection, or even family rejection, rejection also of place of work, increases anger in the persons that is subject to rejection. There are people that are always given to anger anyhow. You know, and you may not understand the origin of this anger. If you take time to simply do what you call a background check, you'll understand that maybe this person has gone through motions of rejection in their general life. And therefore, they become a people that are easily given to anger, anxiety, depression, jealous, sadness. It diminishes performance you know, on difficult intellectual tasks and can contribute, also contribute to aggression and poor impulse control. Very, very true. So, some of the things that we are look that are happening within our societies, whether you're in Africa or you're in Europe or you are in America or Australia, it doesn't matter which place, these are things that are happening in a universal way. One day I was walking on streets in the city and a young street child, street boy came to me and as usual when you see some of these street kids, the first thing we simply say like they want money. So the young man looked at me and he asked me, will I ever be loved? And I'm like, what do you mean? See, sometimes people think that what we need is money or the food they give us. See, some of us, the greatest need we have is love. Just that love. Let me tell you something. Some of the kids you see on the street out there, they are not there out of their own will. It's because they discover at home the environment is so hostile. Parents are so hostile that they cannot put up in that home. So they prefer to go and be with their kind who will love them for who they are. And therefore, they look for love on the street. But the people on the street, on the other hand, they have not known what love is. They have not been, nobody has invested life in them. They have just known hate, rejection. And therefore you find a family on the streets, families that have known nothing but the rejection. And then the same families are able to simply get children. So kids are born by rejected parents who have never known love.
And you wonder why do they become so aggressive and attack people because people that reject sometimes tend to turn into aggressive person as I said before. And therefore, the best place to encounter this unconditional love, which emanates from God, is from home. I want to give a story here in the Bible. A very intriguing story that also moved me and has always moved me. In the book of Genesis, This is about Laban, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. Four persons. But the main person we're going to be focusing on is Leah and Jacob. Rachel partially and Laban partially. But there are two main persons that we're going to look at, and one of the persons is the main subject, who is Leah. This was when Laban was, Jacob rather, was running away from his brother Esau who wanted to kill him because he had taken his place of blessing. But I want to get into that. Now I want us to get straight to the point here. Uh, the Bible says, verse 16, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. First and foremost, these daughters belong to Laban. Both daughters. And when you look at the Bible, it says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Verse 17, the Bible gives us a, dis a description, or rather it's simply helping us to understand their state of being, their physical outlook. The Bible says, Leah's eyes were weak and dull looking, but Rachel was beautiful and attractive. Very interesting, and as I explained before, that sometimes people get rejected not because of their own making. Leah never prayed to have weak eyes or to have this dull look. But the Bible is giving us a definition of how Leah was looking, how she was. And on the other hand, the Bible tells us that Rachel, Rachel on the other hand, the Bible says Rachel was beautiful and attractive. Beautiful and attractive. This is to say, Leah was not beautiful, neither was she attractive. And verse 17, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will work for you for seven years for Rachel your daughter. So Jacob, of course this is from a marital disposition, but I would want you to understand how it also go, goes beyond the marital uh, satyr and also goes in general way of life, you know, affects the other part of human life. So Jacob tells Laban, already the Bible has given us the outlook of these two girls. Rachel was beautiful and attractive. On the other hand, Leah was not beautiful neither was she attractive because she had weak eyes and they were dull to look at so when you look at her you look at somebody's dull so there was nothing attractive about her but then Jacob said I'm willing to work and he was very categorical for Rachel I'm willing to pay a price I'm willing to labor for Rachel not for Leah these are daughters of one man and woman. They are siblings. So Jacob has made his stand and position known. And um, so Jacob fell in love with Rachel. 17, 19 says, And Laban said, It's better that I give her to you than another man. Stay and live with me. So Laban was like, It's okay, I'll give you Rachel no problem. Just work for me. Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. 
So Jacob simply put an effort, labored for seven years just for Rachel. The kind of value, the kind of attraction that Jacob had towards Rachel was outstanding. That seven years was nothing. He was willing to pay any amount of price. Now, try to do comparisons. The Bible says, while you were still sinners, God loved us. I'm talking about the agape love. But this eros love which Jacob had towards Rachel prompted Jacob because his the beauty of Rachel prompted this man to put in efforts to labor for seven years for the sake of getting Rachel, which he did. And the Bible said, Jacob finally, uh, finally Jacob said, Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed, so that I may take her with me. Laban guarded all the men of the place, made a feast with drinking. But the, when night came, he took Claire, his daughter, brought her to Jacob, who laid with her. But in the morning, Jacob saw his wife, and behold, it was a lair. He said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not work for you all those years, seven years for Rachel? Why then have you deceived and cheated and thrown me down like this? I think this is the most painful thing that can ever happen to any woman or any man. And this case it was the woman. Several things that I was able to simply establish about what was taking place in the family of Laban regarding these two daughters. Rachel has a prize, seven years of labor. Leah has no prize. At the completion of seven years, Jacob says, I need my wife now. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Can I have my wife? Laban says, it's quite okay. He gathers men, gathers people that begin to marry, drinking, stuff like that. Then, Laban, the father of Leah, who is the oldest daughter, he goes and takes Leah. Hands over at night in secrecy to a man who is not sober but drunk I mean there's your own daughter I call it the marriage of the night to a man who is not sober and sound he's under liquor influence of liquor Jacob never loved Leah he loved Rachel. So Laban, he's trying to simply help us to understand that he didn't care about his first daughter at all. He preferred to hand over Leah for free because Leah had no price. It seems like Leah had no value. How do you feel that She's being married, given to someone at night for free. She has no price, she has no value. She's being handed over to a man who is drunk, Jacob, and more so at night, the worst is in secrecy. Rejection has vast effects. But the value of Rachel, Leah rather, could only but be displayed in the night to a man that is drunk. Of course, Jacob goes ahead, doesn't look at who this person is, wakes up in the morning and like, what? The rejection even is more intensified. She has given herself to this man. The man wakes up with a different stand. I never paid for this. I mean, he has laid on this lady for free. He does not simply, he regrets. The father has handed over the daughter for free. 
the man was given a woman for free he prefers to simply does not even appreciate instead he ministers more rejection and tells Laban what have you this why have you deceived me this is not what I was looking for the seven years were specifically meant for Rachel not for Leah if you are in the shoes of Leah how do you feel your own dad you're the first born daughter you're being handed over to a man for free without a price because you have no value because you are a subject of rejection how would you feel I can imagine what was going through the mind of Leah at the time I can just imagine that when daybreak comes when you expect to be embraced and to be appreciated you ministered rejection meaning that people that go through rejection is like they are not meant for the public life but the secret life anyhow that's why many people some of them go to isolation they go to the cocoons so after Leah was ministered all this Laban came up with an excuse it's not permitted in my country to give a younger in marriage before the elder so this was what we call a forced marriage that was void of affection that was void of value from the side of Leah finish the wedding feast week for Leah then we'll give you Rachel and Oshel's work for me seven years seven more years in return Jacob complied and fulfilled Leah's week then Laban gave him Rachel his daughter the wife Laban gave Bill her made Rachel his daughter to be a maid and Jacob lived with Rachel also as his wife and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban another seven years for her still Jacob displayed his love more for Rachel in comparison to Leah now look at this 31 that's why I said again the cure for this rejection is always with God and when the Lord saw that Leah was despised he made her able to bear children but Rachel was barren now look at this it took the attention of God the intervention of God God saw everything that was taking place in the life of Leah he saw how Laban gave her out for free he saw how Jacob mistreated her by means of rejection to her and when God saw her that she was despised that means people that encounter rejection they are always despised underrated undermined by other persons always despised I don't know whether I'm talking to someone out there that may simply be feeling the same you've been despised by your siblings you've been despised because of your outlook or your inability to do certain things because this despisement was based on the outlook of Leah she did not pray for that she did not wish that to happen but God decided to simply come and do something that probably would make Leah to be embraced and to be accepted probably by Jacob and the entire family so God made sure that Leah became pregnant but Rachel the Bible says she was barren she could not bear children and the Bible says Leah became pregnant and bore a son and named him Reuben see a son she is she said because the Lord has seen my humiliation and affliction now my husband will love me now look at what Leah is looking for Leah is not focused on the child that she conceived and delivered the Leah's focus is love but the kind of love she's looking for she's trying to peg that love on the child that God had prompted her to get <laughs> so she says to herself now my husband will love me why because 
I've given him a child. My humiliation, my affliction has been, you know, diffused by the fact that I have a child. Did it change anything? Did it change the mindset of Jacob? Never. I want to tell you something. It's only the love of God that comes and conditions all. The love of God that comes without conditions. There are people out there, no matter what you do, you can never make them love you. And from a human disposition, not from a God disposition, but from a human disposition, there are people, no matter what you will do, you will never make them love you. In the mind of Leah, she thought that because I've given birth to this child, now Jacob will love me. That's a first son. Jacob will love me. So the issue was, what am I going to do for Jacob to love me? What is you trying to do that people may love you? Please, don't kill yourself. What you're supposed to do, number one, is to simply embrace the love of God, which is unconditional love. You will kill yourself trying to please people in order for God to love you. Humanly speaking, sometimes we never know how to love people for who they are. I know there are examples of unconditional love that have been witnessed around the world in a particular percentage. But largely, you cannot be able to see that. So, Leah has given birth. She said, no, my husband will love me. I seen what Leah was looking for, love. Are you trying to simply support that person for them to love you? Are you supposed to do things to please people in order for them? Are you trying to buy love? I want to advise you today, don't kill yourself. If that person has not decided to love you, they will never love you. They will never. Your effort will amount to waste. Literally. It's only the love of God. You need to be whole. You need to be a whole person. You need to appreciate the love of God in your life. But if you keep doing things for the sake of making people to love you, you'll become what you call a slave of love. You'll be enslaved by human beings. You'll be wasted. You'll live a miserable life. Because you never appreciate yourself. You never value yourself. Yet God values you. Leah, even after God giving a child, by him saying, wow, thank God, now at least God cares about me. God values because he despised me. It took the attention of God, you can imagine, that he saw that Leah was being despised. Now, the second child 33 Laban became pregnant again and bore a son because the Lord had heard that I'm despised again a reputation of despisement you only despised only the rejected are despised he has given me this son also he named him Simeon you know, Leah had all these kids, but still, within her mind, she was fighting to be loved by Jacob. She gave birth to four kids, but she still never had a say over Jacob. Rachel was always overlooking her, despising her. I'll give a very good example here. The Bible talks about verse 14 of Genesis 13. Now Reuben went at a time of wheat harvest, found man ricks, lab apples in the field and brought them in uh, to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, give me, I pray you, some 
of your son's mandrakes. Leah, Rachel had reached a place, but she does not regard her sister. Her sister's kids are grown. Leah's son has gone to bring mandrakes to her mother. Rachel wants to have these mandrakes on a silver platter. Is that an effort? Look. Leah answered, Is it not enough that you have taken my husband without you taking my son's mandrakes? Also, Rachel said, say, Jacob shall sleep with you tonight in exchange of your son's mandrakes. And Jacob came out in the field in the evening. And Leah went out to meet him and said, You must sleep with me tonight, for I have certainly paid you uh, your hire with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. <clears throat> Lord. For Jacob to can put kids are there. He has given back to kids. He has done, she has done all that she could do. But Rachel has more say over Jacob than, La, than Leah. So Rachel knew that Jacob would never go to Leah's house without her consent. So he said, okay, let the mandrax be the price. Pay me the mandrax of your son. Then Jacob will come. So Jacob comes and Leah meets Jacob and said, well, I've hired you tonight. This is someone who's supposed to be a husband. <laughs> he has become a subject of hire. That's for him to go see his children, to see the wife, Leah. Leah has to pay a price through the mandrakes of the son. Who made her pay? Rachel. Why? Rachel was loved. Leah wasn't. And I look at these things that are happening around the world with men and women trying to simply pay for acceptance. Trying to pay for acknowledgement, trying to pay for appreciation. People can flatter you. People can tell you what you want to hear, but down deep in the heart, they don't mean it. Provided they get, they extract what they want from you. They're willing to say what they want to say. You know, Rachel knew that it was just for the night, not a week, just the night, not even a day, just the night. On the account of your son's mandrakes, Jacob will lay with you tonight. Failure to offer the mandrakes to me, Jacob will not come. I'm talking to someone out there. It may not be in the concept or context of marital setup, but are you trying to force friendship with people that don't really appreciate and embrace you for who you are? Don't kill yourself. If they don't like you for who you are, walk away before your life is destroyed. There are women out there. There are men out there. You're trying to go here tolerated, not embraced. If people don't like you for who you are, God loves you. Don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself, my friend. Why would you put up in a place that people are despising you, overlooking you, underrating you? Why would you put up there? Why throw away your life to the gutter in the name of trying to place somebody? Don't kill yourself. If they don't like you for who you are, walk away. If you have to pay the price for you to be accepted, please walk away. God loves you for who you are. He accepts you for who you are. Don't throw away your life. Because people, I mean, it's a rejection to you.